Hello, honor students. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice winter break and I am excited to speak to you today about civic engagement. I know you had class on Tuesday, which gave you a brief introduction to your course and your service work this semester. And hopefully today's lecture gives you a bit of background on the subject of civic engagement, on the research, what we know about it and what we don't know about it. And I hope this gives you a running start. Um, my name is Karen Robinson. I am a professor in the political science department here at Hood College. I teach the Intro to US Politics course and campaigns and elections and a research methods course. So I hope to meet many of you in person one day if I haven't already. Thank you for accommodating my schedule and tolerating this recorded lecture. I typically like to speak and teach in a much more conversational manner, but um, given our times, this is what works best. So I appreciate your accommodation. So civic engagement, we have to acknowledge that we're talking about this under some unique circumstances. Um, COVID, the coronavirus has brought about a really interesting climate and situation for us to consider how we are interacting with one another and how our interactions are benefiting society or how they may in fact be, be harming our overall um, democratic discourse and connection. So a few things came to mind when, speak, when thinking about civic engagement and COVID. I wanna start with a few positive things and then I'm gonna move on to a few of the consequences I think that COVID has had for civic engagement um, before we move on to the bulk of the lecture and, and defining our terms and so forth. I think in certain ways, COVID has brought about some, some new communities that we might not have anticipated. I am having conversations with neighbors. I'm able to connect with old college friends over Zoom. I'm able to have conversations with people that I wouldn't normally have had conversations with simply because my schedule has been uprooted and the boundaries that kept me um, in certain arenas have changed. And so I think in some ways I'm excited to appreciate some of the new relationships I have with neighbors that uh, were built over quarantine those first few weeks um, and reconnect with people uh, in ways that technology has provided that formerly weren't available to us. I think COVID has brought about some new initiatives that have been beneficial to civic engagement. I have seen so much philanthropy, so many signs for new food drives, young people having various mask making endeavors, giving things away to those less fortunate. I, I think there's a definite spirit of philanthropy that has taken root because of what um, challenges have been brought about because of the pandemic. And then I also think we've, we've seen new methods of engagement be embraced, namely Zoom, right? We are connecting and building community in ways that we would not have appreciated months ago. That said, I, I think obviously we all are, are well familiar with the fact that COVID had po has posed some serious damage to our connective tissue and it has reinforced divisions and inequalities in our society. Um, not only in terms of who is getting COVID and the number of deaths that have disproportionately affected Native American communities, African American communities, but also the distribution of resources, um, vaccine access, as well as quality of education that's been um, unequal in terms of public and private schools. And, and COVID has brought these things to light. Uh, they've always been there, but they're even more pronounced under these times. Loneliness, COVID I'm sure has touched you as it's touched me in ways that I didn't expect, in ways that have made me feel disconnected, even though I'm, I, I know my neighbors more than I ever did, even though I'm on Zoom every day, I, I still feel a great disconnect. And I think many people are suffering and struggling because of that and mental and emotional uh, well-being has been challenged. And that poses a, a, a danger to uh, civic engagement as well. And so I wanted to acknowledge COVID up front. As we move forward, I want you to kind of think about COVID in the back of your mind. I've only had a, a bit of time to reflect upon it. There's not much that we know, um, uh, statistically speaking, quantitatively speaking about how COVID has affected civic engagement, but try to connect some of those dots both today and as you move forward this semester, because COVID has really upended many shapes and forms that we've relied upon for our, our community uh, connectivity. And so we need to be brainstorming and deliberating upon how that's been good in some ways and how it's been bad. 
So I live in Montgomery County. You see a map of um, old time Montgomery County be behind me. And for a number of years now, our county school board has been considering allowing high school students three ex excused absences each year for civic engagement activities. They haven't yet passed it. Obviously, COVID put things on hold. Um, but clearly, this indicates that people value civic engagement, and they think it's something that should be instilled in our youth. One reason why it hasn't passed is because there isn't a readily agreed upon definition of what civic engagement constitutes. Um, can it be political? Can it be partisan? Does it have to be face to face? Can it, can it be online? And so there are a lot of substantive questions, practical questions that the school board has been wrestling with for a number of years now as they think about what constitutes civic engagement. What is the ultimate good that is that they're trying to achieve uh, by these excused absences. And so that, that brings us to a, a consideration of definitions. How should we define this term? If I were with you in the classroom, if I was live, I would wanna hear some juicy, warm, fuzzy terms that we associate with civic engagement and volunteering might come to mind, um, service learning might come to mind, community, things of that sort. So here, are some meaty definitions, and I'm gonna highlight a few things about each of them as we move forward. So according to one theorist, civic engagement refers to the ways in which citizens participate in the life of a community in order to improve conditions for others and in order to help shape the community's future. So some key words here, community, obviously, improvement for others' sake, um, communities, future, not the individual's future, but the community's future. Those are some important components. Secondly, engagement is working to make a difference in the civic life of communities developing knowledge, skills, values, and motivation to make that difference. It means promoting the quality of life in a community through both political and non-political processes. So I'll highlight some political and non-political processes um, in a bit here but I like that expansive uh, identification here of knowledge, of skills, of values, of motivation. It's, it's all encompassing. And this author goes on to say, a morally and civically responsible individual recognizes himself or herself as a member of a larger social fabric and therefore considers social problems to be at least partly his or her own such an individual is willing to see the moral and civic dimensions of issues to make and justify informed moral and civic judgments and to take action when appropriate. It's a pretty sophisticated understanding of someone who is committed to the social good, um, a moral component, a civic component, the idea of a social fabric, right? That fabric, the idea of being threaded together and, and your future is related to my future. Um, we, are, we are united in that. And that is all part of a, of a mature understanding of civic engagement. So we've talked a little bit here about the definition. I have a visual to help illuminate this just a bit more. Um, what is civic engagement? According to this pretty graphic produced by someone other than me, um, it could be political, political involvement, voting, campaigning, um, it's a, there's a social responsibility portion of it, a community research, association involvement, direct service, philanthropic giving, advocacy, and education. So clearly so much of what we want our life to be about hooks onto a number of these things, that we are united with others, that we're committed to our communities, uh, and that we recognize that we can't all do it alone. Um, that there needs to be a group effort to achieve some of these goals. And so civic engagement includes all of these things. And all of these things, as I said earlier, can take multiple forms and, and methods. And a big question that has been looming over theorists of civic engagement is the internet. Can we be civically engaged via the computer and nothing else? And so hashtag activism is something that's been around for a few years now, and, and hopefully you've participated in it. Um, Black Lives Matter hashtag, March for Our Lives, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Um, you've probably seen these on Instagram and, and Facebook and uh, Twitter. Um, does this count? Is someone civically engaged if they are posting a hashtag? 
Well, there's been some research on this and it's not all bad news. Um, we joke and say, oh, people think they're doing their democratic good and they're really just being lazy and you know, pressing a button on their keyboard. Um, here are some cartoons. Click to save the world. I lost my eye in a five day student protest in 1970. And then the younger person says, I just sprained my clicking finger joining a Facebook protest group. Um, and so there's some concern that this has replaced actual activism. Um, however, what we have determined to be the case is that the same people who are engaging in online activism, while we joke and call them slacktivists, that they're committed to good without actually working towards that end, um, the, they're, the same people are doing both. The same people who are volunteering are the people who are posting hashtags on their Instagram account. And so we don't have to fear that there's been this exodus of um, actual face-to-face, mass-to-mask volunteering, and people are just kind of copying out and being free riders and clicking on something online. Um, they're doing both, and that's kind of encouraging, um, and, and we hope not to divorce the two and not to say, you know, uh, hashtag activism is bad, only face-to-face -face is good, um, that they both seem to be feeding the same group, and we hope that group of people grows. Uh, so humor me, if you will, for one moment. Um, my eight-year-old did something that made me so proud this summer. This is, this is uh, online activism from an eight-year-old who has no social media profile. Um, she and I, as we in my house, has been, have been talking a lot about Black Lives Matter and the murder of George Floyd this summer. Um, she proceeded to cut out pictures of protesters that were featured in the Washington Post and put them in her bedroom. And it just made me very proud and it highlighted what I think is, is a critical component here is that before we're actually out there doing things, um, we need to be in here doing things and we need to foster uh, an appreciation, a respect for activism, uh, an appreciation for engagement. And I think as a mother of a young, as young people, um, this is what I can hope for from an eight year old at this time. Uh, that this is perceived as something good, that this is perceived as something effectual, and we hope ultimately that that turns into something um, that has real life uh, good consequences, particularly on behalf of, of racial justice. So we talked a little bit about what engagement is. It's improving community, it's improving others' lives, the goal is for a community's future. Um, I want to next speak about why it matters, and then I'm going to introduce you to some trends and analysis uh, that we have here about engagement in the US. I wanna talk through a few challenges that, that we are obviously facing for engagement. And then I wanna end talking about something known as deliberative democracy and how conversations that cross lines of political difference are critical to, um, to the strength of our democratic institutions and our society. I wish I could pause for questions, but I'm not live, so I will just keep talking. That said, I will make sure my email is attached to this video, and so you can email me if you have questions or concerns or disagree. I just invite feedback in any way, shape, or form. So what is engagement? We talked about the definition, but I want to highlight um, that we tend to idealize it quite a bit, and we think, okay, I'm a civically engaged person. I'm going to go participate in that protest. I'm going to march for that cause. I'm going to be like Greta, um, who, uh, Greta uh, Thunberg, who worked on behalf of climate change, the young girl from, from Sweden. Um, and we, we just, we picture it as though it's worthy, you know, of a, of a movie. Um, but in fact, sometimes our engagement takes a small, messy, insignificant, inconvenient form and I just want to validate you if that is your experience this semester or has been or will be, um, it is still meaningful. And those awkward encounters or those uncomfortable experiences are worthwhile. Um, I had many of them growing up as my parents attempted to help uh, use us to, to serve Thanksgiving meals and, and we, you know, 50 people would show up and they only had 10 meals to deliver. But um, those gestures are, are significant. I really appreciated an article. It was, it came out in around 2018. Um, Pete Buttigieg, who you may know, Biden has nominated, 
to be the Secretary of uh, Transportation, but he ran for the presidency um, for the Democratic nomination in 2020. And he, he actually won the Iowa caucus, which is a, a pretty significant accomplishment for a man who's still in his 30s and was simply the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Uh, but this profile in the Washington Post magazine featured one of his first campaign events. And, and the campaign was expecting at least 50 people to show up and they had eight people uh, show up to volunteer for his campaign. And, and it was kind of a, a bust and there was a lot of disappointment. And I remember reading that thinking, boy, but if they only knew what would come of this candidate, well, what would come of, of Buttigieg um, serving in such a prominent position in the administration. And so I, I highlighted that um, for you just to encourage you. If you are one of eight people that show up to something that was expecting at least 50, it's okay. Um, good things can come from that. Why does it matter? I've spoken in generalities, but I hope to speak a little more uh, theoretically now and then, then ultimately um, share some statistics with you. So democratic theory uh, highlights the fact that for a democracy to be a democracy, we need to have engaged citizens. Um, it's often measured in terms of the quality in voting, effective participation, enlightened understanding, control of the agenda by citizens, and the inclusion of all citizens. Um, Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman who came to observe U.S. society in, in 1830s, he said that the, the strength of the United States democracy, democracy depended upon robust associational life. And Tocqueville described Americans as joiners, that we would just join groups, and that's what made our country unique. The benefits, according to theorists, and borne out in a lot of research, is that an engaged citizenry, civic engagement, will bring about fairness, justice, equality, safety, security, deliberation, representation. These are all the things that are the bedrock. This is what separates a, a good democracy from a bad democracy, um, and they're rooted in an engaged citizenry. We also know that there are psychological and sociological benefits as well. So you are college students and we know that college students who are engaged in service learning, who are engaged in their communities, they are healthier. Uh, they have, um, they're mentally and emotionally more healthy. Uh, they're optimistic and they experience less anxiety. We know veterans that have returned home after um, serving overseas that if they are engaged in a vol if they are volunteering in any capacity, they are more likely to express satisfaction with their life, to say that their needs are being met, their family's needs are being met, that their transition to their civilian community is going well, um, and that their needs have been met by non-military community institutions. And so we know that that connective tissue for veterans is, is very helpful to their well-being. Insurance companies also acknowledge that civic engagement and volunteering are important to one's health. So I like the graphic. I don't love that it came from an insurance company, but it serves its purpose. We, we find here that 94% of people who volunteer say that they have an, they're, an improve their mood. Uh, they say that they're healthier, that they have a sense of purpose, that they, it lowers their stress, that they develop professional job skills that they have stronger colleague relationships and they learn um, about people and teamwork skills and time management skills. Uh, so it, you're hard pressed to find anything to say that being engaged and volunteering is bad for you. Um, time and time again, we find confirmation that it's in fact very, very good for you. So I'm gonna pause here um, because this is gonna take me a minute to explain and I, I just found it a couple days ago. Social responsibility and civic engagement are related. So what I, I proposed to you in, in some previous slides is that civic engagement is good for our community, that we will, we will increase in a sense of, of a shared destiny with others, with our neighbors um, by being engaged. And what some researchers just recently did is they looked at the response rate for the census, which is a survey we get every 10 years um, assessing how many people live in our country. And the response rate varies. But it does 
seem to be an indicator of how one how one's commitment to their community. And so here it's used as an indicator of social responsibility. And they find that in places where a large percentage of people responded to the survey, to the census, that COVID cases were, were quite low in that community. And so what they're arguing using this data is that if you live, if you are uh, really engaged and again, more likely to respond to the census, that you will feel more responsibility and you will wear your mask and you will stay socially distanced. And so there's a correlation between engagement and social responsibility and then consequently a low COVID rate in, in um, your community. And that's why we have seen COVID bring about, um, it almost exasperate a lot of our inequalities. It's because communities that were engaged, that were tight knit, that had the resources, um, they wore the masks and they stayed socially distanced and they live in homes and they're not dependent upon you know, communal living as, as some low income communities are. And they were able to withstand the virus um, contagion a, a little bit better and that's unfortunate and, and that's why some, some, some studies are showing that COVID is, has perpetuated inequalities. But I wanted to highlight this because it was one example of, of some early stage research that's being done looking at COVID and civic engagement and social responsibility. So the state of civic engagement in the U.S. Um, it's not great we first became really concerned about it in 2000. And there was this famous book written by a sociologist named Robert Putnam called Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community. Um, so it was 21 years ago, which is hard for me to believe. I read this book in college in graduate school. Um, and what Putnam found through a lot of extensive survey work is that citizens were disconnected from social structure, structures. Um, the title bowling alone is in reference to bowling leagues that existed when I was a kid. My parents were part of, part of a bowling league. I remember eating a soft pretzel at the bar when they were bowling with their friends. And that was kind of commonplace. So too were clubs and, um, and, and group meeting places because at that time people didn't rely on the internet to communicate. And, and they had the telephone, but there would be a lot more effort to socialize in person. But he noticed in 2000 that, that these entities were breaking down, that there was less voter turnout, public meeting attendance, committees, parties, groups, um, family dinners. There just wasn't as, as much of this activity going on. And he surmised that it was due to the individualizing of our leisure time via the via media and at that time, the early stages of the internet. And so he just bemoaned television and the internet thinking this is the breakdown of our community, of our culture, of our society. And this book brought about great, great, great concern about the state of civic engagement in our country. Um, we are revisiting some of those fears now because as internet use has risen, as smartphones are uh, everywhere, um, it's now being discussed in terms of a loneliness epidemic. Um, sadly, suicides are on the rise. COVID has not helped with this. Um, we see on this chart that the iPhone was released and the number of people saying they often feel left out skyrocketed, right? Because we're all on our phones. Um, promoting public health. I really appreciate this graph. It says, or this image illustration rather, um, please wash your hands, avoid smoking, make connection a priority, right? Um, so this is a health crisis. And um, I wanna reference my notes quickly here because I have some quotes I wanna share about loneliness um, that we all uh, struggle with. Um, reached epidemic proportions. It's produced a loneliness literature of sociological and medical findings. Um, there is a growing consensus that loneliness, not obesity, cancer, or heart disease is the nation's number one health crisis. Persistent loneliness reduces average longevity more than twice as much as does heavy drinking and more than three times as much as obesity. 
Research demonstrates that loneliness is as phys loneliness is as physically dangerous as smoking 15 cigarettes a day and contributes to cognitive decline, including more rapid advance of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and as one author says, we're literally dying of despair. Uh, so this is something that um, I'm so sensitive to because I care about your emotional health, my emotional health, and during this time of COVID, um, we are desperate for connection. And so just a, a sidebar, if this is something um, that, that resonates with you, just reach out. Hood College is, is such a warm place, um, full of people who care and, and want to reduce and um, reduce loneliness amongst our community in particular. But as all this relates to civic engagement, it's a huge challenge that we're now wrestling with. And if this a number of people are feeling left out, it's, it's unlikely that they're going to jump at the chance to engage in their community and, and be equipped enough to serve others when they're um, quite desperate to survive themselves. So I also wanted to highlight one thing that I've been seeing as I've read about some of the profiles of those that participated in the riot at the Capitol on January 6th. And, and remarkably, so many of them were really disconnected from institutions and from society as we typically define it. They were connected online to far right extremist groups, um, which sadly have filled a void for many people um, in their desire to, to be heard and um, belong. And so I think um, this loneliness epidemic has, has fed some of the extremism we see. And of course, we like to fight against that. Um, so I've, I've shared a lot of bad news. Membership and association has decreased, loneliness has increased, but research tells us that volunteering is still happening. Um, and as I highlighted, I, th I think that continues during COVID and, and we'll see what research shows post COVID. But these charts are, are a little dated now. But we find that nearly a fourth of people have, have volunteered. What I want, I use this graph to highlight something that is still true, and that is the disparity amongst um, demographic groups when it comes to volunteering. And this isn't a reflection of desire to volunteer, it's a reflection of um, access, it's a reflection of economic inequalities. And so we see that there is a, a racial gap, we see that there's an education gap, and we see that there's an employment um, gap. And, and the top two are the primary ones of concern. Clearly those that have received a higher education, they might be making more money, they might have more flexibility to volunteer in the course of their work week. Um, and that is often correlated with race as well. And so we see the inequalities that have existed in our society, um, again, perpetuated and manifested in, in who's volunteering and who's not. But the rates for volunteering, they're not zero. Um, they're, they're not as high as we'd like them to be, but people are volunteering. And we know that, that brings benefit both to individuals and to communities. Civic engagement, I highlighted that there can be non-political, non-partisan forms of engagement, but there can also be explicitly political forms of engagement that are important to a democratic society such as ours. And so I wanted to look at voter turnout as an example of the state of our engagement here in the United States. Um, we do not turn out at the same rates as other countries. And many people have expressed concern about that because if we don't have the majority of citizens picking our representatives, picking our president, well, then the authority and the credibility of our elected officials will wane um, and the engagement and the representation will not be as strong as we'd like it to be. Um, so nearly one out of two, um, depending if it's a presidential election or a midterm election of US citizens vote. Um, but this pales in comparison to other countries, some of which require voting, but um, those, those listed here do not. Um, so we are obviously concerned that we don't have as engaged of a citizenry when it comes time to vote. So I'm gonna say something about 2020 in one second. Um, in 2016, we haven't updated this map yet for 2020. In 2016, if did not vote was a candidate, look at what that candidate, how many states that candidate would win. So more people did not vote in the, all the gray states than actually voted for Clinton or for Trump. And so that really helped illustrate 
uh, the problem here that we have a large number of citizens not engaged in the selection of our executive branch, um, and that's concerning. I don't think the map would be as bad in 2020, but uh, I'll say more about that in a second. Age, young people do not vote at the same rate as older people, and that is a concern as well. Um, we need young people not only to vote, we need them to consider running for office someday. As was mentioned, uh, the candidates for our presidency in 2020 were, were um, late 70s, and we need young people in office. The average age of a U.S. senator is, is in the 60s. The average age of the House of Representatives is in the late 50s. Um, we, we want some 40-somethings in there. We want some 30-somethings in there, um, and that will shape the public policy that emerges, and that will shape and, and improve the extent to which people feel represented. Uh, so age, um, a huge contributing factor here is the transience of people between ages 18 to 29. It might be a few years before you're settled and register to vote, but I urge you um, to do that sooner than later. Um, move around, but just register where you're living and, and vote because that's an important habit to foster when you're young. 2020, things changed. And here is where we might see kind of the, the plus side of COVID. Um, because of COVID, we allowed people to vote by mail in ways that have never been allowed before. Prior to 2020, three or four states allowed people to cast their vote by mail, and a handful of others would allow absentee voting. Um, but this year, uh, you, most states didn't require any excuse to vote by mail or to vote absentee. And thus, we saw a dramatic increase in voter turnout. And so this was very exciting. And civic engagement scholars are, are excited to see what this might mean for the future and if we can sustain these numbers and if we can sustain this kind of access to the polls, which not all people agree with, um, will be something to monitor. But I wanted to highlight that 2020, we don't know if this is the new norm or if this is an outlier, but it was encouraging nonetheless to see a lot of records broken when it when it came to voter turnout. And that was true for young people too. They voted at higher rates than ever before. So I wanna pivot now to some of the challenges. Why is voter turnout this low? Why are people not engaged? And the first thing I wanna highlight as a challenge to civic engagement is distrust. Um, and not just distrust in government, which I feature here, but distrust in our fellow human beings. Um, we uh, are, are questioning so many things, and, and to question things is good, uh, but there's such cynicism now directed at so many institutions, government, media, um, universities, uh, the medical profession, vaccines, right? And so this is, is really, um, there's a lot of weeds growing up when it comes to how connected we are because of the levels of distrust. So for quite some time, an uh, organization has asked the public uh, the following question. Does, do you believe that government works for the benefit of all or for a few special interests? So it's just a binary choice. Does it work for the benefit of all or a few special interests? And what this line indicates is the percentage of people who said um, most, okay, just about always, let me see. Oh that it, this is the number of people who say the trust that we can, um, the government works for the benefit of all, most of the time or just about always. So I'll say that again. This line indicates the percentage of people who says the government, who say the government works for the benefit of, of all, most of the time or just about always. So we can conclude from this that very few people today are saying that the government works for the benefit of all. That's what this line tells us, that it's been sharply declining. And the outlier here is 2001, when post 9-11, when terrorists attacked uh, New York City and the Pentagon, um, that we suddenly rallied around the flag, which is a phenomenon known to occur when there's kind of an international or military conflict, that citizens rally around their government saying, we need you in the name of defense, um, and we saw that in 2001, so there's a brief spike, um, but then it, it quickly declined. And, and I haven't updated it yet, um, but it's 
continue, it's down, it's under 20% of people who say that the government works for the benefit of all most of the time or just about always. Uh, so that is a big concern that many people say could really contribute to the further breakdown of our relationships and of our, our society. Another challenge to civic engagement has to do with knowledge. So this is a famous um, and a favorite study of mine. People were asked, a representative sample of US citizens were asked, where is Ukraine? Okay, and they put their dot on their map and then the, the scholars kind of uh, combined all the answers to give us this visual. And you can see there's a ton of people who don't know where Ukraine is. And this survey was done when Ukraine was in the news. Uh, hopefully you know that Ukraine is an Eastern European nation, um, very close to Russia. And there's been a lot of conflict with Russia. Um, Ukraine has been in the news more recently because of, of some things under the Trump administration and Hunter Biden. Um, but this was years before that was in the news. Um, and, and this question, this study followed up with where's Ukraine and what do you think about military engagement in Ukraine with Russia? And you had all these people who had crazy opinions and strong opinions about what the US should do with Ukraine, but they didn't know where Ukraine was. And so this study highlighted the fact that we have a lot of people trying to participate in politics without understanding politics and without knowing uh, where Ukraine is or, or, or whose job is what in the government. And this is concerning when we think of having an informed society that is engaged, that is pursuing the public good. Um, if they don't know where Ukraine is, if they don't know um, enough things about public policy, how can they then pursue what is good, not just for our state, our country, but for the world. So I want to point to this clip from the newspaper. I, I took a, a picture of it. Um, and this reporter um, was down at the Capitol on January 6th for the riots. And she spoke to some of the people rioting. And she recalled one conversation. And this is what she wrote. Is this the Capitol or the White House? One of the people who came to mob the U.S. Capitol asked me, where is the mall? Another out-of-state rally goer wondered while standing on the lawn of the National Mall, which constantly confounds tourists with its puzzling lack of a Cinnabon or Foot Locker. And what the journalist goes on to highlight is that there were people rioting who didn't even know that the Capitol was the Capitol, what the White House was, that they had no familiarity with these prominent institutions in DC in our US government. And she goes on to make the case that all students deserve a field trip to DC from across the world, from across the country, wherever you live, you should get to come to DC and learn about our system of government, which is a good point. I'm highlighting this conversation here because I thought it was so striking that you had people uh, furious with what they perceived to be the outcome of the 2020 election. And they were protesting without an awareness of what they were protesting, where they were protesting and what the Capitol was and where the White House was. And so um, this is concerning for us that we have people who are this uninformed um, and this misguided. And, and that's another conversation to the extent to which lies are being um, spread concerning the reliability of our electoral outcomes. Um, political knowledge is in fact very low. Uh, less than 25% of our citizens can name a U.S. Senator from their state. Um, there's some crazy numbers of how many people don't even know what's protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. I have a link here that I'll include in the email that's distributed with this, with the link to the video, that is kind of a, a person on the street kind of interview. I believe it's at Texas Tech um, University. and. Uh, one of the students there goes around and asks her peers, her fellow college students, various questions about US government and US history. Who won the Revolutionary War? Who won the Civil War? Uh, who named the Vice President? Very few of those featured in this video could name those things. Uh, they didn't know who we fought in the Revolutionary War. They didn't know who won the Civil War and they couldn't name the Vice President, who at that time of this video was Joe Biden. Um, and then she goes on to ask her peers uh, if they can tell us a little bit about Jennifer Aniston's dating history or what show is so-and-so on. And of course, they all rattled off the answers to those pop culture questions quite easily. 
And so it's a, it's a very condemning, condemning video of the state of political knowledge amongst college students. And so I'm a huge advocate uh, for you all taking US history or US intro to US politics because um, it is vital that our future generations understand how our government works. Another challenge to civic engagement, polarization and ideological conflict. So I have the charts here from 94 to 2014 and online you can find the updated charts. But what this highlights is the extent to which Republicans and Democrats have things in common. And so there were 10 questions asked of people and you see that the, the, on, the, on the left, it's the lighter blue, those are the answers in which um, people gave consistently liberal responses. On the far left, if you gave the liberal response to all 10 questions, you were consistently liberal. If you gave the conservative answer to all 10 questions, you were consistently conservative. But what these charts tell us is that that kind of mound of the darker blue or purple, I guess it should be in the middle are people who answered questions sometimes in the liberal direction and sometimes in the conservative direction. And so this group of people who were kind of mixed, who were maybe moderate, but at least had kind of some cross cutting um, issue preferences, the, that, the number of people in that group are decreasing. And in fact, we're having more and more people who are always liberal, liberal or always conservative. And why that is of concern is because when we have a universe in which we never agree, we only agree with these people and we always disagree with these people, we're not crossing each other's paths and we're not meeting people on the other side and we're living in a more divided and polarized environment. Um, and if you trace the ideological divide in Congress as well, it's even more pronounced than this. Back in the day, um, like even 30, 40 years ago, we would have Democrats in Congress sometimes vote re with Republicans and the reverse would be true. Today, you rarely hear of that happening. And if you do hear of it happening, it makes the front page of the paper. Think in the last year or two, when a, a member of the Republican Party has opposed President Trump or has voted for President Trump's impeachment, those people are ostracized by other Republicans and they make the front page of the paper because it's unheard of nowadays to break with your party. And that is not a great sign for a healthy, vibrant democracy that's encouraging deliberation and the refinement of our opinions. Uh, this, these images are of, of concern. Continuing on with this, our divide, it's not just political and partisan, it's cultural. So if you had to guess how strongly a place supported Donald Trump in the 2016 election, would it be more worthwhile to look at that place and say how popular was Duck Dynasty there or how did George W. Bush, the Republican presidential candidate, do there in 2000? Duck Dynasty is a show that never seen it, but it, it's well loved amongst conservatives, um, rural voters in particular. Well, in fact, there's a tighter correlation between people's viewing habits when it relates to Duck Dynasty and Trump support than between Bush voters and Trump voters. Um, so it's not just about partisanship and ideology, it's this cultural phenomenon. And what we're finding is, I, I can ask people, based on some of the research, you know, what is your favorite soda? What car do you drive? Um, where do you shop? And I can make a pretty good prediction about who they voted for in 2020. Um, because if you shop at Target, you're different than if you shop, from, shop at Walmart. If you had eat at Applebee's on um, a Friday night, it's different than if you, now I'm gonna lose another restaurant. But we find that, that there are um, purchasing behaviors, um, uh, television show behaviors that indicate your partisanship in a way that we did not see 20, 30, 30 years ago. And it just indicates that our society is getting more and more segmented and more and more isolated from people who they disagree with. I have a clip here of a, a commercial from a few Super Bowls ago um, that highlights this phenomenon of people being um, so apart and so separate from people who they're different from and why that's dangerous. But this commercial also highlights why it's 
hopeful as well. So I am going to stop sharing here and I'm going to share this commercial and then we're going to talk about that and I'll share some concluding thoughts. I've known what it's like to have absolutely nothing. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely most grateful just, just for life. We've only just met, but I think you're the sort of person that would listen to me and we'd have a discussion rather than, oh yeah, you could hang out with that. Let's go. Good luck with staying right, mate. We tell it a look. Perfect. Oh yeah. It's basically after we just got a bar. Yeah. Just take the bottle and place it on its corresponding markings on the bar. Attention, please now stand to watch a short film. Feminism today is definitely an excuse for misandry, man hating. If somebody said to me that climate change is destroying the world, then I'd say that is total piffle. So, transgender, it is very odd. We're not set up to understand or see things like that. I am a daughter. A wife. I am. Transgender. I feel like the battle for feminism definitely isn't done. The fight is never going to be over, if I'm honest with you. You now have a choice. You may go, or you can stay and discuss your differences over a beer. I'm only joking. <laughs> well, I'm having a drink. I'm having a drink. Yeah. I want to discuss beer. Yeah, beer and discuss. Cheers. At the end of the day, mate, I'll reach out to people. people with you. Yeah. And, you know, even if you wanted to convince people about your point, the productive thing to do would be to uh, sit down. Engage. Out and engage. Beer. I've been brought up in a way where everything's black and white. But life isn't black and white. Yeah, I'm just me. Yeah. <laughs> Smash the patriarchy. <laughs> I'll give you my mobile number, you give me yours, uh -huh. and we'll keep in touch. I'd have to tell my girlfriend that I'll be texting the number girl. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. It never gets old. I really enjoy that clip. Um, if we were together and li live, I would say, oh, 
you know, what did you appreciate? What um, do you think they learned? What did you learn by observing their interactions? I'm going to highlight what theorists have highlighted when it comes to the importance of our engagement across lines of difference. Let me get to the right slide. Be bear with me. Here we go. Um, there is a lot of uh, interest in the role of exposure to difference in democracy. The umbrella is called deliberative democracy. The fact that if we were all the same, um, there would be no growth, there would be no learning, there would be no need for tolerance, um, and that would be unfortunate. The, in fact, the strength of a democracy is dependent upon exposure to differences. So John Stuart Mill is a famous theorist, and he says it's only by the collision of adverse opinions that the remainder, remainder of the truth has any chance of being supplied. Political knowledge. The more people's standpoints I have present in my mind, the more valid my final conclusions, my opinion will be. An empathy with the other. The promise of deliberation is, is its ability to foster the egalitarian, reciprocal, reasonable, and open-minded exchange of ideas, of language. Deliberation is expected to lead to empathy with the other. And I did a lot of research on this uh, a few years ago, looking at, at even reading the rationales the arguments behind opposing points of view, it made people sympathize with those points of view and say, oh, you know, I totally disagreed with them and I still disagree with them. But there's some reasons behind their opinions that I can see how it makes sense and I can see how they came to that conclusion. And I can be more peaceful and more patient in my conversations because I understand them more. And I might like them more because I've, I've gotten in their heads and I've walked in their shoes, so, so, to, so to speak. So what I'm a big advocate for is engagement as conversation. This semester, you are embarking upon a project, a service learning opportunity, and you may have you know, perfect pictures in your mind of what contribution you'll be making to the civic good. But there are gonna be small moments and small interactions and conversations that are nonetheless very significant. One study that I recently came across, 500 Democrats and Republicans came together for cross-party discussions. A 15-minute in-person conversation with members of the other party dramatically reduced partisan hostility relative to those who only talk to others from their own party. And there are lots of lines of difference, um, racial difference, uh, sexual orientation difference, um, regional differences, right? Age differences. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of lines crossing all over the place on those. Um, but I'm highlighting party here because that seems extra salient right now in the aftermath of an election, in the aftermath of the riots on Capitol Hill. Um, we need to, to be really committed to, to not letting people live in the extremes that some people are living in and we wanna bring them to the table. Um, so, so I want to highlight a, a reality here. Um, Trump and Biden supporters have few friends, few to no friends who support the opposing candidate. So 39% of Trump supporters say they have no friends, excuse me, that supported Biden. And 42% of Biden supporters say they have no friends who supported Trump. And what this tells us is that we have people living in different worlds. Um, and depending on where you live, you may only see one sign. I, I, in my neighborhood, I, I, you'd think every person in this community voted for one party because that's the only signs I see. Um, and I, I'm, I, I'm sensitive to that because I re recognize that that's not a healthy democracy in which we have self-selected into neighborhoods that are similar to us economically, similar to us politically. Um, I wanna encourage you to take uh, this quiz that I put, I have do this exclamation point perception gap, and I'll send that link out with this recording. This is a great quick study that you can participate in. It's 10 questions, it's other people are doing it, I'm not involved, but I'm, I love it. Um, and it asks you your assumptions about Republicans, and it asks you about your assumptions about Democrats. So for example, they say, tell us the percentage of Republicans who you think oppose immigration. And it might ask you, tell us the percentage of Democrats that you think 
consider themselves to be socialists. And so you make your guesses and what it reveals to you is that you often really exaggerate and have built up in your mind that the, a party that you're not part of is more extreme than it really is. And what you find is both parties, there's a, t there's a lot of diversity within the two parties that we, we don't readily see and that we don't want to see because it's cognitively complicated. Um, so amuse yourself, take that perception gap quiz just to see, are you being fair to the people who disagree with you politically? So cross-cutting exposure refers to the idea that um, we are regularly encountering people who are different from us, particularly as it relates to, relates to politics and partisan or ideological orientation. Where does it happen? In the workplace. And it might be in the form of volunteering in some of these service learning opportunities. Um, workplace, because we can't always choose who we are working with. We can choose who we're friends with. We can choose who we follow on social media. Uh, we can choose when you're an adult, you kind of get to choose where you live. Um, and, but workplace, that, that self-selection component isn't as readily available. And so they say that, that in those environments, that's where you're likely to encounter people who are different from you. And that's a really good thing. What are the effects? I alluded to them earlier. People are more informed and they're more tolerant when they're exposed to people who are different from themselves be it politics, race, economics, all sorts of lines of difference. They're good things. A pretty illustration for you, the goals of dialogue and deliberation as it pertains to our engagement in our communities. We learn, relationships are improved, trans, uh, conflicts are transformed, um, problem solving, all these goals and skills that are developed from encounter, engaging in deliberation, which I hope you're doing here at, here at Hood College in your classes. And then finally, young people. I know you're Generation Z, but this quote pertained to millennials. And I, I highlight it here because I think I wanna echo what I said at the beginning of, of class. We are rethinking what this term looks like. We're rethinking what volunteering looks like as we are enduring a pandemic, as technological advances has allowed for us to be in community in ways that we didn't think was as possible. So as we look to fostering civic engagement in younger people, um, this is what this group said. Accepting that young people are generally not going to engage on institutional terms is key. They're not gonna be bowling like they were in the 80s and 90s. They aren't gonna show up every Wednesday to pledge allegiance and hear a speaker. So we have to accept that millennials will reinvent civic engagement on their terms it will be more informal and more episodic with more immediate and tangible results. We need to do all we can to make it easy for them to engage, including reviewing a lot of out of date rules in ways that discourage the kind of action they want to put their energies behind. On the other hand, we need to keep pushing them to turn their episodic efforts into transformational change and not ignore the hard work of governing. And I appreciated this effort at the end to say, that hashtags, they're okay, right? Um, send in $20 via Venmo, okay. Uh, but we need to be consistent in our efforts. And I think particularly of um, the effort to bring about more racial equality and justice in our society. So often for, for some of us, um, you know, it's very episodic when there is a front page news story and George Floyd has been murdered and there's another pr police killing, um, but we need it to be consistent and full throttle and we need to connect it to the hard work of governing and change at the policy level. So a few conclusions for you as I wrap it up. Civic engagement is good. I think you knew that. I hope you know that even more. Um, it can bring about good at our, uh, at the country, at the aggregate level, countrywide, statewide, community-wide, but it can bring about good um, for us personally. It can make us healthier and it is um, for our good that we encourage it. Civic engagement, it can be simple. Um, it, can, it can happen in the form of a conversation. Uh, and it's happening in some ways, but there's a lot of room for improvement, particularly when it comes to crossing lines of difference um, and just encouraging engagement levels and political involvement overall. And the nature of it is, is fundamentally different. I think it's forever different post-COVID. I think Zoom is with us to stay, and it's going to be exciting to see 
what your generation might come up with when it comes to encouraging the social fabric that we need for our society to flourish, for people to be represented, for people to feel safe, for people to be equal. Um, and so I just encourage you to think of some of these big picture themes and concepts as you go about your work this semester. I wish you the best of luck. Please do not hesitate to email me. Um, I would love to chat and get to know as many students as possible during this crazy, crazy season of all our life. So good luck with your semester. Thanks for having me. And I hope to see you again uh, sometime soon. And with that, 